it's Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. Hello and welcome to Monster Mondays. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, co-host of the podcast Film Seizure, that you can catch every Wednesday at FilmSeizure.com or at a number of podcast providers online. And beginning this week, new episodes of Film Seizure hit the airwaves with the first of the Godfather trilogy. So join us this Wednesday as we dive into an American classic celebrating its 50th anniversary. Now this week we return to Walt Disney Productions with the 1980 and 81, I'll explain that a little bit in just a moment, cult hit The Watcher in the Woods. Now this is based on a 1976 novel by Florence Engel Randall, and this supernatural horror movie has some definite baggage to it. I think before we really kind of dive into that, let's talk about a couple of the people in this movie because this movie has a pretty interesting and kind of star-studded cast. Now, the biggest standout in the cast is, of course, Betty Davis as Mrs. Aylwood. Now, Davis is, without a doubt, one of the biggest actresses. No, scratch that. She's one of the biggest movie stars in the history of Hollywood. Her career ranged from the early 30s into the late 80s, and I really could not give Davis the proper amount of time it would take to really talk about her. But let's take a few things into consideration. First, I think most people would say that uh, if she was in a movie, it was watchable, no matter the overall quality of the film itself. Second, she recorded 11 Oscar nominations, all of which for Best Actress, none for Supporting Actress. Now, she did win twice for Dangerous in 1935 and then again for Jezebel from 1938. Um, She was so significant that Steven Spielberg himself spent over three quarters of a million dollars of his own money to purchase those Oscars back at an auction so that he could return them to the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts and Sciences, where I suspect they have them kind of in their museum or under lock and key somewhere. Thirdly, Betty Davis was known for her deep blue eyes. Now, while you can say that she had a kind of distinct, almost alabaster look to her, Her eyes were so well known that there's an entire pop song about them. If this was the type of show like Film Seizure, we could go much, much deeper into Betty Davis, but I think I need to give some time to the other people and stuff about this movie before we really dive into it. Co-starring with Davis is Carol Baker. Now, she's a a spectacularly pretty starlet from the 50s and into the mid-60s. Uh, In the mid-60s, she had a series of high-profile roles, like playing Jean Harlow in Harlow. Uh, She was also in The Carpetbaggers that brought with her some success, despite the movie not being so well-received by audiences. And then there was uh, George Stevens' The Greatest Story Ever Told and John Ford's Cheyenne Autumn. She also posed for Playboy in that period in the mid-60s, too. However, she would mostly be known to a certain subset of genre fans as being in a quartet of giallo films directed by Umberto Lindsay. We discussed the fourth of those, Knife of Ice, on Film Seizure in early 2022. When she returned to the States, Baker got into a lot of other movies of significance, like Star 80 and Ironweed opposite Jack Nicholson and Meryl Streep, possibly being every bit as good as those two powerhouses in that movie. David McCallum is also in this. McCallum is a Scotsman who is really best known for two television roles, the first as a Russian agent opposite Robert Vaughn in The Man from U.N.C.L.E., The second is a medical examiner on the hit CBS series NCIS. And also the primary lead of this movie, we have Lynn Holly Johnson, who was a figure skater in the uh, early to mid-70s and later became an actress. Her first notable role was in Ice Castles in 1978, where she did get good reviews for being able to act, despite the movie not exactly being well-received by critics. The same year as this got released, she would have a memorable small part in the underrated Roger Moore Bond film, For Your Eyes Only. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the baggage of this movie. The film was originally directed by John Hoff. Um, Now, we've talked about a couple of his movies in the past, 1971's Twins of Evil and 1982's The Incubus. The original 1976 novel wasn't really a supernatural story. It was a little bit more of a mystery with 
some supernatural elements, but it wasn't so much even a horror novel as it was kind of this tale of time weirdness, immortality, and even God. The alien, uh, what well, the Disney production had this whole interdimensional thing with a sci fi bit with the watcher being an insectoid alien that had a spaceship and it was kind of a mess. The movie was released to New York City audiences in April of 1980 and it got torn to shreds. Now, some of this was due to some of the more extravagant stuff not really being finished at a decent quality. The film was taken out of distribution and rewrites, reshoots, and re-edits were done, but by then Davis couldn't return due to the 1980s actor strike. So, Hoff wasn't... Uh, brought back and this reconstruction and reshoot was handled by Vincent McEvity. Now normally a movie that does this much reconstruction wouldn't get much better reviews and you can argue that was still kind of the case for this but it did get some slightly better reviews upon its re-release in 1981. The first cut in 1980 was rushed to try to celebrate Betty Davis's 50th anniversary in film. And because of that rush, the end was just simply not completed. The reputation of having no ending was fixed with this reconstruction and rewrite. The original opening scene was removed that tied to the much more sci-fi watcher-like creature. And also removed were a bunch of scenes that involved Davis that was considered to be a little too co closely tied to the occult. Now, one of the things about the sci-fi nature, there is still a part of that that does show up in the fourth or in the third act towards the end of the movie. However, the creature itself was completely and totally redesigned. Instead of this being an alien of interdimensional look and feel and, and what have you, uh, it, it's kind of more replaced as like a bleeding through kind of light fixture or light uh, kind of creature that kind of bleeds through the dimensions like that but either which way the film still did not succeed at the box office but like i said the reviews were a little bit better and the movie would end up gaining a cult audience to the point that it is a well appreciated movie now despite all the baggage of the way this movie was kind of frankenstein together now the movie starts with helen and paul curtis uh, which are uh, Carol Baker and um, McCallum. They have come from America and they're moving into a new home in the English countryside. Now, the Curtises have two daughters, Jan, who's the older of the two, and Ellie. Now, the real estate agent clears the sale of the manor with the eccentric Mrs. Aylwood, who seems to take notice of the older daughter, Jan, played by uh, Lynn Holly Johnson. In fact, she ends up staring at her a lot. Uh, she's not the only thing that watches Jan. The titular watcher in the woods also has a vested interest in the teenage girl. Now, Mrs. Aylwood is quite inquisitive towards Jan as well. And she asks Jan if she is kind and if she is sensitive, specifically if she senses things. Naturally, Helen and Paul want to rent this manor for the small price of a thousand pounds. Now, Jan is not so sure about this. She's feeling strange stuff about the place. She feels that something really bad and very unsettling happened here. The real estate agent thinks that Jan was the actual reason why Mrs. Aylwood, this very eccentric old lady, let them lease this manor. Mrs. Aylwood had a daughter Jan's age and she went missing many years ago. When the family leaves with the agent, Mrs. Aylwood tell, tells the wooded area around the manor that, quote, she's going to be staying there and asks the unseen watcher if that is, quote, what it wanted. As the family moves in, weird stuff happens right away. For example, Jan is setting up a mirror and cannot see herself in it. When the mirror cracks in a very specific triangular shape, she sees a ghostly vision of uh, kind of blindfolded and reaching out toward her. And Jan's younger sister, Ellie, begins talking in her dreams. And also Jan sees Mrs. Aylwood uh, making late night trips into the woods. Then when Ellie picks out a puppy at a nearby farm, she comes up with the name Narek for the puppy. 
but it's actually because she's seeing the word Karen written on the other side of this window that she's looking out of. Ellie claims it was Jan who told her the name, but Jan was talking to the farmer's son several feet away. The farmer's wife is quite shocked when she sees Karen on that window. Now, when the puppy runs off into the woods, both Ellie and Jan go into the forested area, and they're kind of enchanted by the beauty of these woods. But that soon turns to terror when a suspicious light first appears in the pond, and then a second light behind Jan knocks her into the pond. Mrs. Aylwood comes to the rescue, but at first it appears that she's trying to hold Jan under the water with this stick. But her actions were actually meant to kind of free Jan from the branches in the pond that was kind of uh, that Jan was kind of tangled up in. So this um, really kind of shows that Mrs. Aylwood is not the creepy old lady that we might think that she is. It also gives Jan a chance to find out more about Karen from Mrs. Aylwood. Now, Mrs. Aylwood confirms that Karen was blindfolded for a game with the other kids in town when she went missing and that she did look a lot like Jan. And also, Mrs. Aylwood believes that her daughter Karen is still out in the woods. At a motocross race, the watcher warns Ellie to call Jan over before a motorcycle goes flying off course and would have hit Jan where she was standing watching the race. Later, when Jan explains that she thinks Karen is speaking to her, uh, Mike, the farmer's son, discovers that his mother Mary was friends with Karen at the time that the girl went missing. Mary explains only a little bit about the night that the girl disappeared. In fact, she's actually quite evasive. Later, Mike takes Jan and Ellie horseback riding, and he wants to cut through the woods, but Jan initially doesn't want to, but something in the woods spooks the horses, and Ellie is nearly hit by a truck, while Jan is taken to a cemetery within the woods uh, that's... uh, kind of connected to this chapel Uh, a familiar triangle of light guides jan over to a coffin where she sees the blindfolded karen again and this is the chapel that was burned down the night that karen went missing now despite mike not really buying into anything supernatural going on jan begins to believe that karen is trying to give her clues as to what happened to her one of the other boys that uh, was friends with Karen when she was when they were younger, Tom Colley, uh, he was there the night that Karen went missing. Uh, actually, at first believes Jane is Karen, and he thinks Karen has come back to punish them for what they did that night. John Keller, yet another of these kids there that night, says to never talk of that night again. Jan first tries to talk to John, but she really doesn't get anywhere with him. Then she talks to the somewhat dim-witted Tom, who realizes that Jan isn't the ghost of Karen, but uh, that she's just another girl that happens to look a lot like Karen. He is very kind and tries to heal animals that he finds in the woods that were harmed by poachers, but eventually Tom does explain that they were playing uh, basically a game of ring around the rosy. She was blindfolded because of some sort of initiation into some sort of secret society that John led that Mary and Tom were a part of as well. But during the initiation, lightning struck the chapel and the place caught on fire. Tom looked back to see that Karen had disappeared, had basically disappeared in thin air. Soon, through the help of Mrs. Aylwood and Jan's poking around, Ellie starts acting as a vessel to tell them what they must do to help Karen. However, before they can find out who is actually speaking through Ellie, Helen comes in and tells their daughters that she is taking them out of there tonight, the very night, or at least within the very next day, of what it is that whoever it is that's speaking through the younger Curtis girl says that they must do something to help Karen. As Helen drives the girls out of the woods, the entity in the woods ends up preventing them from escaping. And the next day, Jane figures out that it's the eclipse that is coming that afternoon that is key to saving Karen. Jane asks Mike to get his mother Mary along with Tom and John to the chapel before the eclipse. Mrs. Aylwood is worried that this will only cause the same thing that happened to Karen to happen to Jan. And when they recreate the ceremony, it's revealed that the Watcher and Karen swapped places. The Watcher then became stuck on Earth, 
and Karen was transported to the Watcher's dimension. When the ceremony completes, at the time of the eclipse, Karen re-emerges, still the age that she was the night she disappeared, and it was all a big mistake that took Karen away in the first place. And the movie ends with Mrs. Aylwood reuniting with her long-lost daughter. Let's talk about the three things that I liked about The Watcher in the Woods. First, I really like the general atmosphere of this movie. It starts like so many movies of this kind uh, of that era, too, where a family is moving into a new home that is isolated and on the edge of a vast forest. Of course, there's ominous music, and we see the point of view of something that is watching the family arrive. It's a good, creepy opening. It has all the setup of a spooky, I don't know, like campfire tale or something that you should watch every October. It's effective at setting that mood. Knowing what the original opening was going to be with uh, this little girl coming coming across the Watcher and it being this more alien-like creator or you know creature, this makes a million more, a million times more sense because it helps set up the isolation and the kind of loneliness of the manor and the creepiness of that wooded area. Of course, he also gets lots and lots of fog in those woods too. That's always a plus and helps compound that atmosphere. Second, there really is an interesting mystery to this movie's plot. Is it a ghost story? Is it time shenanigans? Is it guilt? Is it interdimensional stuff? Is it an alien? Is it just the pain of loss? We know something is going on because we're seeing things through Jan's eyes, and she's definitely haunted by something, but what is it exactly that kind of keeps you guessing, at least through the first couple of acts? Now, admittedly, I will make a comment about the Frankensteining of this movie into a new conclusion. There are a couple of missteps that the movie still has in that final act due to this reconstruction. At one point, Jan and Ellie's mom... Helen gets surprisingly upset and ready to leave the manor right away when she finds Ellie and Jan doing stuff related to this haunting. We never saw her ramp up to that frustration with Jan in particular. In fact, Jan even has to apologize and say that she would never hurt her younger sister, that she loves her. We have no reason to understand why the mother is so angry at the older daughter. But secondly, the interdimensional stuff does kind of happen real quick at the very end some connective tissue is missing for those two plot points but that said this movie still works as a whole the mysterious elements of this plot are relatively well staged Uh, even when you know spooky stuff is about to happen you are along for the ride and it's an exciting little movie that i think really should become required viewing for preteens and teenagers Third, without a doubt, Lynn Holly Johnson carries this movie. I mean, even more so than the other far more experienced actors around her. She's incredibly likable as an actress. Of course, I always knew her from that small role that I mentioned earlier in For Your Eyes Only. She was already likable in that as kind of a sweet, naive, and yeah, kind of oversexed figure skater who wanted attention from anyone, and I mean anyone. And yes, she's a very attractive young woman, which only helps her be that much more watchable. But she kind of plays this good girl role very well. I suspect that she's supposed to be playing a little younger than her actual age was. But she's sweet and kind of perfectly cast as this uh, Disney-type lead character. All that really helped get me pretty invested pretty fast in this movie. Now that wraps up this week's Monster Mondays. You can catch new episodes of Monster Mondays each Monday at FilmSeizure.com. And don't forget to follow Film Seizure at Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And also make sure that you subscribe to Film Seizure to get both the Film Seizure podcast and Monster Mondays at your favorite podcast providers, as well as YouTube. You can also check out my website, bmovieanima.com, to read new articles every Friday morning. Now next time... We are going to uh, break the seal on another Monster TV series, but one that definitely aims for a little more excitement in action as I watch the first two episodes of Ultra Q. So until next week, stay spooky.